Hi, friends. I'm John Kempf hosting this podcast. I am passionate about developing regenerative agriculture systems that improve soil health, produce crops that are completely resistant to diseases and insects, and produce fruit of such an exceptional quality that we can have a legitimate conversation about growing food as medicine. I've discovered that there are many people with incredible knowledge and information about soil and plant systems and how to develop regenerative agriculture systems. However, much of this knowledge and this information is scattered. It's found all over the place. Some of it has been published in peer-reviewed publications, but there are many incredible stories and a lot of knowledge that has not been published and that hasn't been shared with many people. I started advancing eco-agriculture in 2006 to bring this knowledge together in a more coherent fashion and incorporate it into products and growing systems that growers can easily put into practice. It's my personal mission to have these regenerative agricultural systems become adopted globally and become the mainstream, the status quo, against which all other growing systems are compared. To help achieve this goal, I want to share the knowledge that we have learned in the last decade and make it available to everyone. While we have developed products at AEA that embody the principles of regenerative agriculture systems and make them easier for growers to apply, this knowledge and these principles can be applied anywhere. And when they're applied properly, they will always increase farm profitability and resilience to climate stress. If you have any questions, suggestions, comments, or ideas, topics that you would like for me to discuss, please connect on LinkedIn or on Twitter, where my username is at VisionBuilder7, or you can also email me at uh, john at johnkempf.com. I would very much like to hear from you and to hear your feedback. Be sure to su subscribe to this podcast, and thank you very much for listening. Enjoy the show. Greetings, friends, and welcome to the Regenerative Agriculture Podcast. On this podcast, we explore the science and the practical application of regenerative agriculture ecosystems, how to regenerate soil health, regenerate crop health and quality, and how to increase overall farm profitability. Our goal is to give you clear, easy to understand, and actionable information that you can implement on your operation. In this episode, I'm very excited to welcome Dr. Larry Phelan, currently from Ohio State University onto the show. Larry has done some intriguing research over the years looking at plant and insect communication systems and what might increase plant susceptibility to various insect pests, as well as looking at the concept of biological buffering and the capacity of plants to absorb nutrients from the soil profile in the form of microbial metabolites. Larry, we're very excited to have you on the show. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, well, the pleasure is all mine. Thank you. Larry, you've, you've done some fascinating work over the years looking at many different aspects of soil and plant ecosystems. What are some of your most memorable moments that have led you to where you are today and led you to some of the projects that you were working on? Well, first of all, I want to start off by saying that uh, all that we do is <clears throat> generated by the observations and uh, the experiences of, of farmers. And so I actually, when I, this area of research uh, represented a pretty significant career change for me. Uh, I was actually trained as what's called a chemical ecologist, which means we would identify pheromones and uh, plant attractants for, for insects as possible alternatives to uh, pesticides. Uh, but as I was doing this and started talking to organic farmers, one of the things that kept coming up was that they had fewer problems with insect pests than their conventional neighbors. This is uh, not true necessarily of all crops, but these were uh, uh, field crops that I was <clears throat> that I'm talking about here. And was really intrigued by that and found that there was not that much uh, known about that in the literature. And so um, talking to them, uh, we basically formulated hypotheses to, uh, to try to understand what it was that they were observing. So first of all, we, uh, we did document that what they were saying was actually true and, um, and pretty consistently we're seeing lower levels of insect damage. And so, yeah, that just uh, um, <clears throat> really changed uh, the direction of my, my research. And so now we, about 20, 25 years ago, uh, I 
switched and we started focusing on the soil and the microbial community and nutrient cycling and all kinds of things that I really didn't know that much about at the time. But uh, uh, you kind of have to go where the data takes you. With, with some of the original research that you did comparing the insect pressure on the organic farms versus the non-organic farms, uh, this is actually something that um, I, I often hear these stories from organic growers, but I haven't uncovered a lot of research where people have actually tried to do a comparison and uh, evaluate the differences. So what were, I guess the question that I would have for you is what were the differences that you were seeing? What, uh, what really stood out for you? Well, again, keep in context that this was, you know, 20, 25 years ago. We, there's been a lot more research in organic systems now. But at the time, uh, you know, organic farming was considered very unscientific and, um, and more new age and not uh, amenable to large scale uh, production and, and all of that. And so we, I was uh, working with a lot of uh, organic farmers that were basically doing their own research, you know, not necessarily replicated research like we would do at the university, uh, but trying different things and seeing what worked on their farm. And so this is the context in which we got started. And so I actually received a lot of criticism at the time uh, that what I was doing was, you know, not very productive or not uh, the direction that I should be going as an untenured faculty member, uh, particularly. So, uh, but what we did was we went to these, um, in this case, these were uh, corn, soybean farmers, and the organic producers were, I think all the ones we worked with also raised uh, uh, animals, had animals integrated into their system as well. And uh, first of all, just did census of uh, using, looking at their corn, looking at uh, the levels of European corn borer damage uh, in their fields versus their conventional neighbors. And uh, as I'm sure you and, and many of your listeners have already often heard, uh, I kept hearing this idea that if we have a healthy soil, then we're going to have a healthy plant and insects don't like healthy plants. And so that's why they don't see the damage. And so again, I saw that as, uh, although that in itself is not a very scientific statement, we could reformulate that as a hypothesis that we could test empirically. And so what we did was to collect soils from these organic farms and then go right across the street to a conventional neighbor, collect uh, their soils, brought these soils into the greenhouse and planted them uh, to corn and either fertilized each of them either with uh, an organic fertilizer like manure or compost uh, or with a chemical fertilizer. And so what we were interested in figuring out was first of all, whether the insects could tell a difference in these plants. And if they could tell a difference, was it associated with that, what I would call the short-term effect of the type of fertilizer you use or that long-term effect of that history of management and how that impacted the soil community. And so uh, after setting these plants up and letting them grow uh, to a certain stage, we then uh, released European corn borer females that had been mated into the greenhouse. And uh, again, all of this was replicated and randomized. And uh, uh, we just let them loose and see their, where they would lay their eggs. And what we found very consistently we actually repeated this experiment, I think, with four or five different pairs of farms uh, or soils from farms. Uh, consistently, we found if the plant was growing in a soil from an organic farm, irrespective of the fertilizer we applied, they received relatively few eggs. Whereas if that plant was growing in a plant or a soil from a conventional farm, sometimes they would receive a lot of eggs and sometimes they would receive only a few eggs. And so this gave rise to this concept that I call biological buffering. So the way we envisioned this, and this was kind of our working hypothesis, was in, that, uh, in those organic systems where you have a, uh, a recurring influx of uh, organic matter, either in, in terms of cover crops or plant manures or animal manures into those, into those soils, you create this um, a soil community uh, which is beneficial to the plant. And so when nutrients then go into that system, uh, 
uh, they get absorbed by this microbial community, and then they release those nutrients very slowly over time. And uh, as a result, uh, we hypothesize that those plants are in better mineral balance than when you're putting down high levels of nutrients. Why this would be important is that plants uh, are almost always limited by nitrogen levels. And so they don't have mechanisms uh, for uh, dampening the levels of nitrogen that they take up. They're going to take up whatever they can get. And in this context of, of putting down uh, inorganic, highly soluble nitrogen sources, uh, often these plants uh, are taking up much higher levels of nitrogen than they are uh, really set up to, to deal with. Uh, and so we then hypothesize that in that situation, those plants would tend to accumulate the simple compounds. And so as you have an imbalance of nutrients, when you have an imbalance of nutrients, let's say nitrogen to potassium, if you think about those two elements, nitrogen, of course, is very important in terms of protein synthesis, and uh, potassium is also important in terms of converting uh, amino acids into protein. So if you have an imbalance, you have too much nitrogen relative to potassium, what happens is you get the buildup of free amino acids in those, in those plants. And insects love free amino acids. That's a very digestible uh, source of, of nutrients for them because they're also highly limited by nitrogen. And so uh, in those uh, situations where you have these imbalances, uh, that plant becomes uh, very nutritious for the insect, whereas in the plant that is in better mineral balance where they're getting their nutrients relatively slowly, that metabolic machinery of the plant is able to act uh, more efficiently. And so as amino acids and sugars are produced in the plant, they're more immediately uh, converted to the uh, less digestible and more complex um, building blocks uh, of the plant like proteins and starches and cellulose and that sort of thing. Larry, you've mentioned a, a couple of, of fascinating pieces that I'd love to unravel a little bit more. The, the idea of a biological buffering, um, what, what you're describing in essence, if I'm understanding you correctly, is the capacity of biology in the soil to absorb large amounts of nutrients that are applied and kind of contain those nutrients within their cells and then release them over a period of time. Is that what you're describing? Yeah. So, you know, even in this artificial situation that we created where we put inorganic fertilizer into a soil that had a, an organic history, even in that situation, that organic soil, that soil from that organic farm had enough carbon lying around where those microbes could actually use that inorganic form of nitrogen and then, and then you, in combination with the carbon that was there and then uh, yeah, bring that into that microbial community. And then, um, yeah, as they then die off, you know, and you have uh, other organisms that are feeding on those microbes, uh, they then uh, allow for the mineralization of some of these uh, compounds, these nitrogenous compounds, and then it becomes available to the plant. And so we did, uh, to follow up on this, we studied uh, the dynamics of nitrogen uh, across the growing season in these uh, organic and conventional corn fields, just as we would have expected. When you look at a conventional system where you have uh, in the spring, now, the farmer is putting down relatively high levels of soluble fertilizer and really not much carbon other than maybe some plant residue. You see huge fluctuations in terms of the availability of, of, those, of that nitrogen. So, of course, uh, before a fertilization, nitrogen levels are very low. The farmer applies the fertilizer. Now they shoot way up well above what the, uh, the plant can, can use. And then over the course of the growing season, the, that nitrogen then declines. But if you look at that same pattern in an organic system, what we found was that the levels of nitrogen, of, of um, soluble nitrogen in the soil solution generally were lower overall, and they also didn't vary much during the course of the year. 
And so that plant was getting this kind of constant uh, supply, steady supply of, of nitrogen throughout the growing season. And really what we found when we compared these uh, farms was that overall uh, there was no difference in terms of the production at the end of the year uh, between the organic and, and conventional farms. I'd also love to understand the the insect attraction piece a bit better. You mentioned that when you have this surge of nitrogen supply on the non-organic farms from the nutrient application period, you have an increased attraction because you have a nutrient-rich food source. Why are insects, why can insects not utilize plants as a food source that don't contain as high levels of amino acids because don't they would also contain some level of amino acids, no? Yes. Yeah, all plants are going to have some uh, levels of, of free amino acids, and they can also digest protein. Uh, let's, um, you know, let's keep that in mind, too. But that protein, uh, it's going to take energy for that uh, insect to digest that protein. Furthermore, uh, a lot of plants have defenses that involve the inhibition of, uh, of enzymes that break down protein in the insect. And these are called proteinase inhibitors. And this is actually, in, in terms of uh, what we call inducible defenses, this is one of the mechanisms of, of many, or the responses of many plants to insect attack. They start uh, the production of these proteinase inhibitors in order to reduce the uh, insect's ability to digest that protein. It basically knocks out those, uh, uh, those proteinases in the, in the insect. And so the insect um, doesn't necessarily starve, but it slows their development way down. Well, in that situation, if you've also given that plant much, you know, these high levels of nitrogen and it's accumulating these free amino acids, that now short circuits that plant defense system. So in other words, the insect doesn't need those proteinases as much because it has, it's getting these free amino acids that it doesn't have to break down. Got it. That, that was a piece that I had always um, not fully understood because I've, I've heard it described that uh, insects don't have the capacity to digest complete proteins and that they're dependent on soluble amino acids as a food source, and that that never quite made sense to me. It, it made sense on um, as a uh, from a theoretical perspective, but it didn't make sense to me that plants might have no amino acids versus one plant having very high levels of amino acids. Yeah, it's it's a matter of degree, and even proteins <clears throat> they vary in terms of their digestibility for for insects too. And of course, insects evolve. Uh, enzymes that are going to be most effective uh, in digesting the proteins they're likely to encounter, you know, depending on what, what host plant they feed on. As you were looking at these plant insect and dynamics uh, in the field and, and developing your hypothesis of biological buffering, what was something that surprised you? Uh, that's a good question. I yeah, I don't know that this was necessarily a surprise. Uh, maybe I'll think of something that was more surprising later. But uh, the one thing that was particularly exciting to us is when we took the next step and we tested this idea that mineral balance resulting from uh, this biological buffering of organic matter, uh, we started growing plants hydroponically so that we could vary the proportions of different nutrients. And the, the idea is that if uh, the hypothesis we were testing was actually that when the plant was in good mineral balance, you would get both a good growth, but also resistance to, to insect attack. And then out of, uh, as the plant uh, moved out of balance nutritionally, you would see uh, plant growth go down and insect performance actually go up. And then ultimately, as the plant was way out of balance nutritionally, then we expected that the plant, you know, wouldn't grow very well. And, and then ultimately, the insects wouldn't do very well either because it was just uh, uh, such a poor host plant. And so we, we tested this with a, a number of different combinations of nutrients. And the one that was most dramatic uh, that actually supported uh, 
this prediction was uh, looking at soybeans in which we varied the ratios of uh, ammonia to nitrate to the plant. So we provided it all the nutrients that it needed in constant uh, uh, levels for all the plants. But it, uh, the, what we were testing was different ratios between these two different forms of nitrogen. And what we found was that as we increase the amount of ammonia up to about 30%, that is where we saw the best plant growth. So those, that, that ratio of 30% ammonia, 70% nitrate is where we got the best uh, plant growth. And then when we looked at uh, insects, so what we did was to pluck the leaves off of these plants and then feed them to insects and see how the insects uh, grew. And uh, this particular insect we were working with was the Mexican bean beetle. And when we fed these leaves to the Mexican bean beetle, we saw just the opposite response. So in other words, where the plant was out of balance nutritionally, not growing very well, that's where the insects did uh, grew the largest, and that's where we saw the best survivorship. But as we moved towards that 30% ammonia, where the plants were growing their biggest, uh, insect survivorship, larval survivorship, dropped from about 90% down to about 30 or 40%. So uh, it was a very dramatic effect and actually more, even more dramatic than what we were expecting. Uh, and then when we followed up on this and we measured the levels of free amino acids in these plants, it was consistent with prediction. So then in other words, those plants uh, that were not growing as well, that were out of balance in terms of these, this ratio, they had much higher levels of free amino acids relative to that 30% ammonia plant. When, when you were looking at these various ratios between ammonium and nitrate, uh, what was the total nitrogen rate being applied? Well, in this case, you know, again, we are growing these hydroponically, so uh, it wouldn't be really, I don't know that it would be relevant to okay, the, the field setting. We actually tried uh, uh, we ran this experiment with three different total levels of, of nitrogen uh, in solution and, uh, and saw the, the most dramatic effect was it with the highest level of nitrogen overall, and that's where we got the best plant growth. Absolutely fascinating. It's fascinating research. So going back to the discussion regarding biological buffering and the things that you observed with um, insect attraction or desirability, um, what is, if you were to extend that out and, and the additional research that you've done over the years, what is the practical take-home message that a grower should consider thinking about or implementing on his farm? How, how do we take this information and put it into practical application? Well, in the, all the studies that we've done and, and, uh, uh, and different things that we've looked at, this message just keeps recurring that of um, denoting the, demonstrating the importance of organic matter addition to the soil. And so, um, you know, as I've said before, the, the mineral balance is, is, is part of the picture. That's really important. But the dynamics of the nutrient availability can be, is, is also important. And so, in other words, uh, we need that influx of active organic matter going into that system in order to sustain this beneficial microbial community. And uh, that has the effect not only of balancing those nutrients, but it also enhances this other completely different group of microbes that I'm sure you're, you're already familiar with. And these are the ones that live in the rhizosphere, including what we call the plant growth promoting rhizobacteria and rhizofungi. Uh, they are also enhanced uh, in, a, in a system where you have uh, relatively low nutrient availability, uh, but uh, being uh, made available to the plant in a sustained rate. So you have a number of benefits that uh, flow from that uh, influx of organic matter. And imagine your, most of your listeners are already familiar with this distinction, but when we talk about organic matter, it's important that we distinguish between old organic matter and uh, and biologically active organic matter. So when you get your soil test, most of that organic matter in your soil test is what we call recalcitrant or uh, this uh, organic matter or organic matter that's 
you know, hundreds or thousands of years old, and it's now in a stable form that microbes can no longer utilize and break down any further. And so now this has, this provides the benefits that we're all familiar with in terms of uh, tension of moisture and, and buffering of, of pH and that sort of thing. And that's actually where this concept of biological buffering came from, is we already knew these chemical and, and physical benefits of soil organic matter. And what I was trying to do was extend this concept to the biological realm of the soil and show how this organic matter also could buffer biological interactions between the plant and, and its environment. And so what we need to uh, measure and focus on is that active organic matter. So this is the relatively uh, young organic matter that's going into the system, either as, like I say, plant manures or animal manures, you know, the plowing down of, of cover crops and that sort of thing, uh, different sources of that. That, to me, is, uh, I think, really key to a successful uh, ecological-based agriculture. When you use the terminology of biological buffering, kind of the extended implication is that when, when you are buffering something, you, you're buffering something that has the potential to have a negative impact. I think in this case, perhaps referring to nutrient applications that contain high concentrations of soluble ions that are serving as an electrolyte, which might have a damaging effect on soil biology. What, what did you find the impact to be of the, of a, say, a nitrogen application on the soil's biological profile? Well, we are, we haven't uh, actually measured that directly. Uh, before we started the podcast here, I mentioned to you a project that we have, we're doing now in Cleveland, looking at the impact of industrial legacy of, of Cleveland's uh, soils and its history of lead smelting and uh, uh, metal works and in whether to what degree organic farming could improve those soils. And so we are starting to look at, for the first time, my group, not others, others have, have done this, but our group is for the first time is actually starting to identify the microbes that are living there. And we're certainly seeing differences in terms of those communities, um, depending on the levels of, of nitrogen that are present. But we, in that study, we're not comparing, say, organic uh, farms to conventional farms. Uh, we're, we're comparing unmanaged soils to uh, organically managed soils. So we don't expect to see the same differences we'd see if we're doing uh, this study out in the, the rural setting where we're comparing uh, farms that have high levels of organic matter going in uh, versus those that are not using organic matter. But so I can't can't specifically you know tell you what the differences are. I can I can tell you it definitely has an impact in the in the soil community and in terms of the uh, uh, the plant response. And this gets us into a different realm. But uh, the plant is in control in terms of this uh, rhizosphere community. So uh, it is pumping out high levels of uh, of, of carbon into the soil. Uh, some people have estimated uh, the amount of photosynthate that it's produced. It's pumping out as much as 40% of that into the soil. And, um, and that's a huge amount of investment. So that tells us that that plant is, must be getting something from the soil community. But more recent studies, very recent studies, uh, have demonstrated not only is it, it pumping out, the plant pumping out the uh, uh, things like sugars and uh, um, alcohols, polyalcohols, but it can actually change uh, the soup that it that it uh, sends out depending on what it needs. So it's actively recruiting a microbial community. It appears uh, depending on uh, what it's what the stress is or what the uh, deficiency is. And likewise, if you put in high levels of, of nutrients, uh, that plant is not going to pay that microbial community to, uh, say, uh, harvest uh, phosphorus from the soil for it, for the plant, because the plant can get it for free. It's just lying around there where it's very readily available. And so uh, it will shut down th those uh, exudates and 
and uh, close itself off from infect infection by mycorrhizae and, and beneficial microbes. Uh, but this <clears throat> has other effects too, because those beneficial microbes and those mycorrhizae uh, provide other benefits to the plant, including increasing the, uh, the, the surface area of the root system. So uh, to gather water, for example. So you can imagine in a situation, and I think we commonly see this, that in the spring, if you're putting down high levels of nutrients, that plant not only uh, closes out these or shuts out these, these, uh, these mycorrhizae, it also tends to grow a relatively sh uh, sh uh, shallow root system. And because, uh, again, it's getting all the nitrogen it needs there, all the nutrients it needs. And so it's going to invest more in growth above the ground. Well, what happens when you come to July and then now the rain stops and we start to have a drought? That plant is in trouble because it doesn't have the root system to deal with, you know, uh, trying to gather the water from a larger area. Whereas when you had this... Uh, symbiotic system uh, with, with the mycorrhizae and they are stretching out further into the soil, uh, you now have, have help in that regard. So those are the sort of things that, <clears throat> that I guess I would point to as evidence of, of buffering of these extremes. So the idea is that uh, you want to create a system, manage your soil to create this um, environment where you the plant doesn't encounter the extremes either in terms of outbreaks of pathogens or outbreaks of insects but also in terms of its resilience to abiotic stress like uh, drought or or heat Larry this is a this is a fascinating conversation I'm smiling quite widely because you have pointed out a couple of pieces that we have observed in the field the to your first point regarding mycorrhizae, we have absolutely observed that when growers apply soluble phosphorus at planting or at transplanting for a vegetable crop, that there is very limited or perhaps no mycorrhizae association, not just for a period shortly after planting, but in many cases for the duration of that plant's life, particularly for annual plants. And yeah. so I certainly have observed that. But I think the the piece that has really caught my attention is what you're describing in essence is the idea of putting on soluble fertilizers at planting as a row starter on broad acre crops is perhaps the exact and precise wrong thing to do because you are limiting the development of the root system and limiting the development of the microbial community in the rhizosphere is essentially what you're describing. Yeah, and I think that that stems from, and, and I have to say that I'm not a, a, a field agronomist here, so uh, I don't want to step too far out of the bounds of, of what I, I really know. Uh, but I, I would say that, you know, my impression is that that starts from the idea that, you know, we all want to get those, those plants up and moving. And so I can see the, uh, the appeal of putting down a little starter fertilizer so you can get those plants uh, growing quickly. <laughs> Uh, but uh, again, one of the things that we observe in, in terms of this uh, organic conventional comparisons that we did 20 years ago was the difference in the growth pattern. So when we were comparing these paired farms, you know, early in the spring, I was looking at these, uh, you know, go to the conventional field and I see these plants that are very dark green and rich and they're up to my knees and I go over to the organic farm and the plants are kind of scrawny looking and and not very tall and I'm thinking man this this farmer's going to get hammered in terms of yield there's no way this this organic field is going to yield and yet what happens we would find was those conventional plants would grow very quickly and then they would stall out and then the uh, kind of like the tortoise and hare so but the organic plants they would grow slowly but they would eventually make it up to the same point uh, in terms of, of plant growth. And as I said, uh, overall, across these three uh, pairs of farms that we looked at over two years, uh, we saw no difference in, in yield. This is, this is really intriguing for me because everything that we have been taught in mainstream agronomy is that you absolutely 
it, it would be absolute heresy to consider not applying soluble nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in the furrow at planting. And yet, I have uh, we have a handful of growers that we've been working with for several years, uh, both directly within at AEA and then also some of the colleagues that I work with who insist that they've been doing this for a number of years um, on applying only in salt. So they, they still apply an in furrow application, but there is no nitrogen, no phosphorus, or excuse me, I should say no soluble phosphorus, only insoluble phosphorus in the rock phosphate form and no potassium. And uh, and along with uh, calcium and magnesium and trace minerals. So they, they are applying an in solution, but it does not contain any appreciable quantities of NPK. And it's been really intriguing for me because these growers, and I'm thinking of several corn producers in particular, have had the largest root systems of any corn plants that I have ever observed. And when we were using sap analysis, in spite of there being no phosphorus applications, these corn seedlings at a very early stage had higher phosphorus concentrations than those areas where phosphorus was being applied. And I, um, I kind of suspected that there was this microbial interaction going on that was contributing to that, but I never anticipated that it could be quite that big of a response. It was absolutely fascinating. Yeah, we did uh, uh, early on with these, and this idea of, of biological buffering, another uh, study we did was when we were growing plants in the conventional and organic soil with the different forms of uh, fertilizer, uh, we did uh, mineral profiles of the, the corn leaves. And one of the things that was really interesting there is when we compared the, the mineral profile of a leaf, of a corn leaf in the con from a conventional soil uh, that had been given uh, ammonium nitrate its, um, excuse me, its nutrient profile was uh, hugely different from a plant that received no fertilizer. And, but in the organic soils, when we grew plants there and we added either manure or ammonium nitrate, those, uh, mineral, the mineral profiles of those leaves were not that much different from the unamended plants. And again, uh, all of those plants uh, grew very well and uh, they were uh, it was not that they were all small, uh, but uh, they were all actually uh, uh, pretty large. And so that kind of gets back to this idea of the buffering system. So even in the short term, without uh, the influx of soluble fertilizers in that organic system with that active microbial food web, uh, they can provide nutrients to the plant uh, and enough for it to, to grow as it needs to grow. You've looked at agriculture ecosystems from a higher level, perhaps a more macro perspective. What is something that you believe to be true about modern agriculture that is different from the mainstream view? Well, I guess my uh, maybe most heretical uh, statement would be that I think that the use of soluble fertilizers has been one of the most disruptive practices for mainstream farming in terms of looking at that that soil, looking at that field, looking at that farm as an ecosystem. And for many of the reasons we've already discussed here, we have uh, another of the things that really struck me as I started working with organic farmers was the difference in the way they viewed what they did and whether they were successful or not. So for the organic farmer, or let me start with the conventional farmer, in terms of the way we've designed uh, the farming system, it's, it's much more of a, what we would call a prescriptive approach where you have a problem and then you apply a product or you apply some material uh, or you have some um, practice to solve that problem. And so it's reactive or anticipating a, a problem. Whereas in the organic system, it's a much more systems perspective that these farmers were, were taking. And so they often didn't even know what their yields were. They couldn't tell you what they were. All they knew was they had enough for their, their, their animals and that their animals were healthy. And so they were looking at the whole system. So that was their indicator that things were working well, uh, that they had a good balance between their animals and their uh, crop production, their forage production, whatever, um, and that the, uh, and that the uh, 
dairy cows were, were producing well. So that was their, their metric. And so in that case, and this kind of gets back to another difference uh, in terms of the way maybe a more conventional agronomist would look at organic matter as a fertilizer, most people would say, well, the problem with organic matter as a fertility system is so much of that nitrogen is tied up would be the phrase that I would hear. Well, I don't see that as a negative. I see that actually as a positive when you think about this over the long term, because yes, uh, it's tied up in the sense that it's not immediately available to the plant, not all of it's immediately available to the plant, but you've got money in the bank there for the next year. And so the idea is to build as you're converting to maybe uh, a more ecological approach uh, or an organic uh, system, uh, you are building that, uh, uh, that bank account, if you will. And so that now, if I can extend the, uh, the analogy, now that bank can start to, to give you interest and uh, you can start to live on the interest rather than to be always uh, living on the principal. Larry, what is a book or a resource that you would recommend that more growers and agronomists should read or pay attention to? Oh, boy. Um, well, I think there are a lot, like I say, there's been some, some great advances, I think, now in terms of uh, uh, organic research. And so I think there are a lot of books and um, uh, some, of them not, some of them relatively small, but uh, very informative books that have been put out and that are very practical in terms of talking about uh, cover crops, talking about different uh, uh, sources of fertility or organic fertility. And uh, so I would recommend, uh, you know, people maybe go to ATRA or uh, ORF, uh, excuse me, ORFR, or uh, even the National Conservation uh, Service is really, there's been a, a real shift in, in the attitude of uh, scientists in this regard. So like I say, when we first started, it was considered unscientific. Uh, now people have, have recognized uh, the observations of these uh, uh, pioneer farmers or farmers that really have been our mentors and, uh, and the mentors of uh, some other scientists as well and, and now have a better understanding maybe of what's going on there and why these systems work. So I think there are a number, I don't know that there's a specific book that I would point to, but uh, yeah, a number of, uh, number of uh, books and guides are available now for uh, organic uh, fertility and organic soil management. Yeah, we have a lot of resources today that weren't available even five years ago. Yes. Uh -huh. ago. What is the question that you wish I would have asked? Well, I think you've done a pretty good job of, of, <laughs> of covering. Uh, maybe, uh, I guess I'm, because it's so recent and we're just finding some, some neat things out in these uh, urban soils, uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk a little bit about that. Please, I'd love to learn more about what you're doing. Yeah, so the, you know, the idea is that in, in, in this, the work that we've done so far, we recognize that uh, the importance of this soil community in terms of uh, producing a healthy plant, right? And so now when we have this situation uh, where this, this soil in these, these urban centers like Cleveland, uh, where we have uh, huge numbers of buildings being torn down, uh, we have something like 20, 25,000 vacant lots now available in Cleveland. And we have all this open land uh, that the city is looking for ways to, to best utilize for the benefit of the community. And one of the possibilities they see is, is urban farming and bringing healthy food into those neighborhoods. But if given that legacy of, like I say, outfall from smokestacks and uh, and we know that the in many areas there are elevated levels of lead and other heavy metals. Uh, we wanted to know to what degree has that impacted uh, that legacy? Has that impacted that soil community? And if we if um, the community converted some of these lots to food production and particularly using organic methods, could they rejuvenate that soil to bring it back to create a healthy environment again? Or are those soils just lost and we should recommend that the, they just be planted to green space or something like that, <clears throat> some other purpose other than farming? 
And so one of the, and so what we did, what we're doing is comparing the uh, various aspects, the chemical, the physical, and the biological community of these soils from these vacant lots that have this uh, insult of heavy metals and, and petroleum contaminants. Uh, compare this to some organic farms uh, in, in Cleveland, and then compare that to the Metro Park soils. So these are soils that uh, are kind of what we would consider the proxy for what the community would have been like before Cleveland uh, settled there and disturbed the soils, and then also rural organic farms. So we wanted to know, do these, these uh, organic urban farms, are they able to uh, improve the soils in the city? And to, are they able to improve it to the degree that we see uh, in the rural setting? And we found some really interesting things. Uh, for, for example, uh, most striking, and, and we haven't even published this yet, we've just, uh, uh, just found this out <clears throat> that uh, with the influx of organic matter in these organic farms, it's not only reducing the levels of lead that are in the soil there, uh, but also the lead that is fit there, it's reducing the bioavailability of that lead. And so now we're real excited about that. And so this suggests uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, an avenue through which some of these cities can improve their soils and reduce the uh, the danger of lead in the soil uh, by, uh, you know, increasing the amount of organic matter going in and the type of organic matter going in. So if you're able to effectively bioremediate lead and some of these other toxic elements, uh, and in essence, what you're describing is that they're not being absorbed by the plants, which is really powerful. That's correct. Yeah. So that's that's really uh, a lot of research is moving in that direction, you know, because, you know, elements like lead, they're not going to break down. You know, you can't get rid of them. They're going to be there. So somehow you got to pull them out. So you either have to remove all that soil and bring in new soil, which obviously is extremely expensive, uh, or you reduce the uh, the availability of it. And so in that case, uh, if it's not available, you could uh, a human could eat this material, this, this form of, say, lead, and it would just pass through the system without any uh, harm uh, to the human or to the animal or whatever, or to the plant for that matter. So, yeah, that's the way things are kind of moving towards trying to see are there ways to reduce that bioavailability of that, uh, those heavy metals rather than actually try to remove them from the system. I think that actually can be a very important piece that we may need to consider, not just for the legacy of urban regions, but also uh, we, we have many pollutants that have been applied in agricultural areas as well. For example, historically, a uh, one of the historical pesticides that was used in apple orchards was uh, lead arsenic. And uh -huh. so we have that we have that legacy in some agricultural soils of, of having some fairly toxic elements in quite substantial concentrations that need to be remediated. Yeah, I hadn't actually thought about that. That's, uh, that's certainly true. That would be interesting to look at. Absolutely. I think there's a very there's a need for that and for looking at reclaiming some of these soils. And uh, one of the pieces that we actually see quite a bit of, perhaps more in orchards and, and regions where there were historical orchards than anywhere else, is the, the damaging impacts on soil biology of chronic pesticide use and pesticide exposure. So often when, when we talk about the, some of the potential damaging consequences of, say, glyphosate or certain fungicides or whatever it is we might be discussing, kind of the, the immediate area that many people jump to is thinking about large-scale broadacre crop production, corn, beans, small grains, and so forth. And certainly there is there is substantial um, pesticide use in some of those areas, although it's spread out over very large acres. But I think where it's highly concentrated is in these fruit production areas um, where orchards, and the same is true to some degree of vegetable production as well, but orchards get chronic year after year applications of very intense herbicide, insecticide, and fungicide applications that uh, we see having a very detrimental effect on soil biology. So it's a major area that I think we need to look at. Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good point. Um, yeah, I mean, these, uh, 
uh, particularly with the high, high value crops, there's a high incentive to protect that crop. And so even if you don't know if there's a problem, I think that there's a, a tendency to just be on the safe side and, and spray. So yeah, I could I see don't. where, yeah, you could have uh, accumulation of uh, high levels of, of compounds that are, are disruptive to the ecosystem there. Yep. Larry, thank you so much for joining us on this podcast and for sharing your wisdom and your experience. We very much enjoyed this discussion and conversation. I'm sure that our listeners have as well. And uh, I look forward to continuing this conversation with you and having you back on the podcast at some point in the future. Thank you very much for being here. Well, thank you, John. This podcast was brought to you by a great company that I work for, AEA, Advancing Eco Agriculture, the leader in regenerative agriculture since 2006. At AEA, we believe in challenging the status quo to find more profitable and regenerative ways to grow crops. We also believe that healthy plants are resistant to pests and disease, and that to grow healthy plants, we must first think different about agriculture, about empowering life instead of suppressing life, about regeneration versus degeneration. To achieve this, we formulate and sell products that help growers produce higher quality yield with less risk of crop failure. In short, we help growers make more money with less risk. Thank you for listening.